Hi, and welcome to Goop Book Club. So excited to have you all here joining us for our first book club of the month. This is a super special one. Um, as a reminder, we are coming to you live, so you can submit questions for our author who we'll bring on in a second, um, right in the YouTube chat box. If there are any tech glitches, hopefully not, but I'm sorry, I am in the office today, so I'm hoping my Wi-Fi is stable. Um, okay, so Goop Book Club. I'm Kiki Korshatz. I'm the VP of Content here at Goop and our book club ringleader. Um, as many of you know, we read one book every month-ish, I would say. And we have chats at the end of the month with our authors. We also have a private Facebook group where we, where we discuss the books. Um, and occasionally we have Zoom meetings with just our book club members to chat. And you can always find more in info at goop.com slash goop book club. So today, as I said, is a really special one. Um, for the past month and a half, we've been reading Lost and Found by Catherine Schultz. Um, this is an absolutely stunning memoir. Um, Catherine is a staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of another book called Being Wrong. She won a National Magazine Award and a Pulitzer Prize for the really big one, which is an article many of you might remember about um, seismic risk in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but this novel, uh, this memoir, sorry, Lost and Found, is told in three parts, Lost, Found, and. Um, Catherine will talk about all of them today. The first section is about Catherine's enduring relationship with her father, who dies about 18 months after Catherine meets the woman that she goes on to marry, C. Um, and that second part of the book, Found, is really about their, their love story. Um, I've said this before, but it, it's worth saying one more time. It's so rare that you pick up a book and from the first page, you just know, and I just knew with this book, it was going to be one of my forever, ever favorites. The writing is so beautiful, so poignant, um, along with Catherine's own personal story. It tells stories that are historical and cosmological and scientific. Um, it's surprising and life affirming and. I think so often life can feel like a slog. It can feel mundane and topsy-turvy. And this book really reminded me of what is most beautiful and precious and special and joyful about our time here on earth. And I know that is a really big thing to say, but it is 100% true. And Catherine, I'm so happy to have you with us here today. So thank you so much for writing this book and for being with us. And we will bring you onto the screen now. Hi there. Hi. First of all, thank Good you so much you. for an incredibly beautiful description of the book. You know, it's really rare as an author to hear someone describe the book you were trying to write. <laughs> and I feel like you just did that. So thank you. That's lovely. Well, you were 100% successful. So, um, and you, thank you so much, agreed to read a short excerpt. Do you mind starting reading that for us today? No. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so the excerpt I chose, it's very short indeed. It's literally just a couple of paragraphs because I don't want to um, just bore people and read away at you while you're already watching me through a screen. Um, but I chose a moment um, when basically the two main characters of this book meet. Um, you might imagine that the author of a memoir would be its main character, but I tried very hard actually not to be the main character. Uh, so um, the real heroes of this book are my father uh, and my partner. And um, as, as you heard in Kiki's introduction, and maybe know because you've already read the book, um, they did not overlap in this life for very long, sadly. I met my partner in 2015 and my father died in 2016. Um, but, but their meeting was a wonderful one and, and very delightful and precious to me. So I'm going to read the scene in which that happens. Um, you don't really need to know much except that uh, my partner and I were, our, the relationship was quite new at the time, uh, and it was a sign of how excited I was about her that I decided to take her home anyway. <laughs> um, and uh, we, um, at the time I was living up in the Hudson Valley of New York, but I'm from Ohio. So we had driven home to Cleveland to see my parents and we had just gotten home and walked in the door and, you know, been offered drinks and food and whatever and, and settled in on the couch. Uh, and, and here's what happened then. It wasn't until I was well into adulthood that I realized how many people, when they first met my father, found him terrifically intimidating. Anyone who came into his orbit immediately became the focus of his omnidirectional curiosity and his unbounded instinct for hospitality, 
which together went flying toward their object in a gust of jokes, questions, rapid fire information, and heavily accented English. None of this ever phased me because I knew from age zero that he was all bluff, benevolence, and adoration, but it scared the living daylights out of some of my shyer friends. In country songs, fathers greet their daughter's suitors by sitting on the front porch, saying nothing and polishing a gun. My father would invite you inside, offer you a sandwich, a scotch, three different flavors of ice cream, tell you anything, ask you everything, and for a certain kind of person, be twice as frightening. C, as it turned out, was not that kind of person. I have seldom been more filled with joy and also already something like pride, so thrilled was I to have her in my life, than that first day when I sat there listening to her talk with my parents. It filled them with similar joy, my mother later told me, to sit there watching us. Amid all the questions and answers, one exchange in particular stands out, occasioned by the fact that C was raised, as no one in my childhood was, to say sir and ma'am to her elders. My mother, who had worked hard to instill good grammars in her own children, good grammar in her own, let me try this one more time. My mother, who had worked hard to instill good manners in her own children, found this charming. My father wanted to know if her parents had served in the military. No, sir, she explained. She was just from the kind of family and the kind of place where that's how things were done. Well, be that as it may, my father said, you're to call me Isaac from now on. I have never known C to miss a beat, and she didn't miss that one. Okay, Sir Isaac, she said. I love that passage. So that's the little moment in the book when the main characters finally meet up. <laughs> I love that because it does a good, such a good job of bringing out each of their idiosyncrasies. And even it's funny, your little slip with manners to grammar, because you do such a good job <laughs> in the book of also showing how your mom taught you guys grammar was a big thing. Um, but I'm curious because you do such a wonderful job of bringing your father and C to life, all these quirks they have. And, and as you were, as you were thinking about writing this book and shaping it around these, these two important figures in your life, how did you think about bringing them alive on the page? Like, how did you think about which details? Like, I love the small details, like with C, you're like, you, when you learn, like she drank her coffee black and all day long. Um, and you know, you do such a wonderful job of describing your dad's mind and just how it worked. And how, how did you, did you kind of like have a map where you were like, this is what I wanted to distill down their essence? Or how did you kind of filter that as you, you were going through and, and writing the book? Gosh, that is a great question and actually one that no one has asked me before. Um, I wish I had had some kind of map or plan um, that would suggest that I was a much more organized writer than I am. Um, no, I think I just, um, I of course carry around in me a very strong sense of who these two people are. Uh, and, and in the case of my partner, um, I'm of course, you know, every day I, I, I live with, with her specificity and, um, and the wonderfulness of that. Um, and, and in the case of my father, I, you know, was, was raised by him and, and lived the, most of my life uh, in his presence. And so I had this large well to draw on, but it's a really interesting question because it's kind of the fundamental question, right? What makes us who we are? You know, what do you, what do you choose as a writer to help convey to someone who has probably never met these people? And, and in the case of my father, because he's now dead, never will get to meet him. H how do you figure out what it is that seems distinctive about that person? Um, and I'm very grateful actually to an earlier read early reader of mine who read the manuscript and said to me, um, you know, can we, can we just have like a physical description of your dad at some point? Because I'd made it all the way through the book and, and not um, described him at all. I do describe C very briefly physically when we first meet. Um, and, and of course our bodies and, and who we are are important parts of us and important parts of how we make our way through the world. And somehow that little nudge, um, I don't say much about my father physically and I know it's not quite the question you're asking, but I it was the sort of aha moment of, yeah, the point is to bring people into the room as if they could see him, right? And and it's not that you need to know, oh, he was five, six and, you know, overweight and had a big beard and whatever. All those kinds of details like that can be helpful. It's that it reminded me, you know, when we meet someone, we get a wealth of information about them right away from how they talk, uh, from from how they hold their head, from from how they interact with you and with others. And it's our job as writers to 
create the room the readers walk into it and, and meet this person. Um, and that might be as good of a job as I can do for answering you. I mean, I know I cherish the characteristics I, I picked out um, for them both. Uh, I love my dad's laugh. Uh, it, it really lives in my heart uh, and I wanted to bring it out on the page. He had an incredible mind. I knew I had to write. Both of them have remarkable minds. So I knew part of what I was going to do was was write about their intellects. But um, yeah, it's funny, you know, I. I'm in our studio right now where my partner and I both work much of the time and there's like seven mugs sitting around because in fact, like she can consume gallons of black coffee and they sort of accumulate until, you know, eventually we go take them back into the kitchen. And yeah, you know, you're, you look around your life and you think, ah, yes, this, this is dear to me. And, and this is part of someone I love. And, and you try to put that in the book. I'm glad you used the word specificity because I, it's like, I feel like I can picture your dad sitting in his chair that where he, you, how you describe him. And then I think one of my favorite passages of the book is when you first meet C coming down Main Street and, you know, you're, you're playing with the idea of this trope that, you know, when we meet, when we meet our person or our other half or someone who we're going to go on to fall in love with that, you know, this idea that we complete the other person and you say, you know, how whole she was and how, how specific she was just walking down the street. And it's interesting then you say in hindsight, like, how did I even, did I even know that that was, that was her at the time because you had never met her? Um, but no, and I think, you know, it's always such a delight when a reader brings forward those, those qualities, those qualities when the character is formed or the person is formed by all those little specific details. Um, I mean, another one I loved is like when you talk about how seeing your dad both, how it, you know, crushed them when they couldn't remember like a minor detail from the book that the rest of us would be like, what was the title of that book? Um, you know, and how they had these specific like quirks where I think you say C would kind of like be like, don't, don't speak, like give me a minute and like kind of go like into her ball. Um, so I thought all of those were just like wonderful, wonderful details. Mm -hmm. One thing I was wondering is how did you initially decide that you were going to explore this idea of loss, losing, and searching and finding? And then at what point did you kind of realize it was going to be bigger than a personal story? And I don't mean that like in a positive or a negative way, but that you were going to weave together all these other elements from like historical stories to fables to great literature to what the cosmos say. Um, and how did you kind of decide you were going to put those two ideas or, or put those two ideas within one book? Mm. You know, to be honest, it was there from the beginning. Um, and I, I feel lucky about that all the time. One of the really, um, I, I think, arguably the biggest challenge as a writer, um, other than, than kind of finding an idea in the first place, is structure. You know, how are you going to put something together? What's it made of? Uh, and in the case of this book, I, I knew the structure right away. I knew it was going to be this three-part book, Lost, Found, and and. Um, and. And in fact, it was the idea for that structure that made it become a book for me. It, it made it feel like a book and made me want to write it. Um, but, you know, in terms of the... Um, the, the, the kind of range of scales that the book works at from the personal to, you know, history and philosophy and, and the cosmos writ large, um, uh, fairy tales to your point, all, the, all these other things that work in there. Um, I always knew they were going to be there just because it's how my mind works, you know, on, on some level as a writer, you know, you, you, you are who you are and, um, and you can't escape it. So you might as well work with it. And I know that I, um, I just, you, you might, then the negative way to say it would be, I'm distractible. You know, you give me one subject and I think about 15 others that are vaguely related to it. And I, I, I want to figure out how they're connected and, and make them work together. Um, and, you know, specifically in the case of this book, um, I love a good love story and I love my own love story. And it was such a pleasure and a luxury to get to write about it. And I loved my dad and I I'm so happy to have been able to honor his memory and who he was in writing this book. But, um, you know, I'm very mindful in many respects. My life is a very ordinary life. And this book is to a great extent about ordinary life and, and its pleasures and its wonders and its pains. Um, but because of that, it just felt to me, of course, these things want to reach beyond us. You know, grief is bigger than we are because it's about the mystery of how we come into existence and, and we leave existence. Um, and love is bigger than we are because it's, um, you know, it's, it's about the mystery of how someone crosses our path that, that um, makes us 
just know they're the person. And, and that's deeply about humanity and, and, and kind of how we're wire, wired. So it felt inevitably to me like it had to reach um, much beyond me. And, and also, I'm just, as I said, I'm of limited interest, but, but the world is infinitely interesting and other human beings are infinitely interesting. And I think, too, it shows, I mean, one of the things that was interesting to me in, in each section of the book was this, just this idea of scale and the immensity of our earth and, and where we sit in our life in comparison to that. And I felt like the book structure also played with that idea, too. But there's this passage on 181 that I love because, um, you know, I think it's sometimes like we don't know which way to go. It's like, does the scale and the immensity of, of the earth and the universe, does that make us feel like small and alone and sad? Or does that make us feel like in awe and so grateful? Um, and I think I love this passage is what an astonishing thing it is to find someone loss may alter our sense of scale, reminding us that the world is overwhelmingly large while we are incredibly tiny, but finding does the same. The only difference is that it makes us marvel rather than despair. And all the vast reaches of space among all of life's infinite permutations out of all the trajectories and possibilities in people on the planet. Here I was in this house falling along beside sea. Um, how, like, how did you, how do you like in your own life kind of think about this idea of like the immensity of, of the world compared to like how small our lives are and, and what it, did that change like throughout writing the book? I'm grateful to you for being such a good reader of this book. Um, the, the truth is, um, for many years, I actually wanted to write a book that was just about scale, <laughs> because I, I do think it's incredibly interesting, right? I mean, are we are we enormous or are we tiny? You know, some days we feel one, some days we feel the other. Um, it depends on whether you're comparing us to a to a photon or to the galaxy. And uh, and certainly emotionally, I do think we all have these experiences of feeling absolute awe at at our tiny little place in the universe you know you look up at a starry night and you think the very you know sophomoric but also i think very universal thought of like how do we come to be here how is this possible and it's hard to know whether we're insignificant or, or whether we're just amazingly precious because we exist at all um so yeah it, it was always going to be part of the book because i do think it's really central to this idea of losing and finding and a, and a big part of how both loss and discovery make us feel um you know, I tell this story in the book. And there's this moment where I, um, I'm hiking with a friend along the uh, along the beach in Costa Rica, and she lost her Ray Bans, and we just immediately gave up, right? You know, like pair of sunglasses versus the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean wins, right? <laughs> and and, uh, and then seven hours later, we're we're returning on that same hike, and um, astonishingly, the ocean kind of gave her back her her sunglasses. You know, they were hanging from a root covered in in kelp. They had just been swept back into us. And to me, that's so representative. You know, of course, we felt just astonished, right, and and gleeful, um, and amazed, and grateful. And and you step back and you think about the ocean and how big it is and how unlike likely it is that such a thing would happen. And it's so trivial, right? That's such, it's literally a pair of sunglasses, you know, who cares if, if, if they get lost or if you're reunited with them, but it is the essence of the experience of finding and um, on a very different and, and more meaningful scale. It is what happens when, we find, when you fall in love. It, it feels incredible that the universe has given you something like that. Um, and I think in my life, um, Look, I'm human. I I feel both. As as you were just reading that passage, I certainly, um, I think as we all have, have had moments of feeling insignificant and powerless in in the face of forces that feel much stronger than I am, and a world that feels much larger. Um, but for both moral and emotional reasons, I I really do kind of throw my lot in with the side of um, of amazingness, right? Like, yes, we're small, but but we're here and um, and incredible things happen and, and we can make incredible things happen. Uh, and I, um, yeah, I think whenever I can, I, I kind of side with um, with awe and, and with being amazed that we're here and amazed in spite of, of the scope of everything beyond us, that we do find each other, we find incredible things uh, and make meaning out of our lives, um, even though sometimes they do feel infinitesimal. Yeah, and I feel like that is such a natural like inclination. Like I think you say somewhere else in the book, like we have this tendency to once we find something to to describe it as being lucky. You know, the, this idea that there is this benevolent, you know, the universe 
or whatever you want to call it, bends in some benevolent way when, you know, we we're, we feel like we're given something that maybe we didn't deserve. And it's just, I love that, that passage with the sunglasses because I think it does such a wonderful job of describing that. Um, and I think it's so interesting that you, I mean, you talk about the differences between you and C in terms of re- religion and sort of how you, yeah, just could maybe you can talk a little bit about that because I thought that was really fascinating how you, you kind of your guys different sort of spiritual beliefs and non beliefs and how um, there, there's that other wonderful passage where you talk about like maybe it's not the answers that are important, but that you two are kind of exploring these two different questions. But I do think it's fascinating, like for a lot of readers, it's like you've written this book, obviously, about loss and finding and a lot about death and grief and that you don't necessarily believe in an afterlife that that maybe other people do believe in but you still find a lot of spiritual i don't want to say like meat isn't the right word but there's a lot of like meaning in both ways so i'm just curious how you've kind of like thought about that as you were writing the book and maybe in relationship to c's beliefs yeah i mean it's a really great question and a really big one. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll try to answer two parts of it. And, and one is about sort of the role of difference in relationship, because Yessi and I are very different in, in some respects, obviously very similar in, in many others. Um, and then, yeah, you know, this question of, of how do you contend with the with the really big issues of life, you know, with death or, or with the miracle of, of meeting someone who you fall in love with, um, either with or without um, a kind of um, theological basis or 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 faith in god um to the question of difference in relationships you know um this is why finding is so wonderful right you know i found someone who i knew right away was right for me or almost right away uh and and i was right about that uh and and she's amazing and fills my life with joy um but you know never in 10 million years could i have um created her or summoned her out of the ether or or imagined what she would be like before she came into my life. And, and that's true because of what we were talking about, about specificity. I mean, people are really unique and, um, you know, I guess a really good novelist can just make one from nothingness, but, I, but I'm not a novelist and I can't. Um, and, you know, it was certainly a, a surprise to me who I fell in love with. You know, um, we come from very different class backgrounds. Um, we are probably the biggest surprise is, is the the point you're raising. We um, have very different belief systems. I was raised Jewish um, in ways that are really meaningful to me. I mean, my father was a Jewish refugee to this country. His religion, um, as is unfortunately true to one degree or another for all Jews, had been, um, you know, a source of trauma and displacement in his life, as tragically it never should be. So I'm very um, I'm very mindful of Jewish history and um, very. Jewish traditions feel very precious to me, but um, I never really um, responded to Judaism as a faith. You know, I, I think I've just always, who knows how these things happen, you know, personality or education or what, but I, I've i always been a deep skeptic um, and I, I don't subscribe um, to the notion that, that there's a benevolent deity kind of um, managing all aspects of our lives. Sometimes I wish I did, um, but my partner absolutely does. Uh, she's a devout Lutheran uh, and um, a very sincere believer. And I think if you'd asked me beforehand, I would have said that would be a source of real conflict, um, bordering on kind of unimaginability. Well, how will we make a life work? And especially, you know, if we have kids, which now we do. Um, and in point of fact, it's been a source of incredible illumination and delight, uh, which is great, right? I think one of the really wonderful things that falling in love does, uh, like any kind of surprising find, is it makes the world bigger for us. And and you learn a lot about someone and you learn a lot about the world. And um, I, I do find that my mind, my heart, my community, my understanding of others have all been sort of enormously expanded by, by falling in love with someone who has, um, in some respects, yes, just a at, at the kind of ground floor of a wildly different perspective on the world than I do. Um, uh, and one that's informed by, by Christian faith and Christian love. Um, but you cited a passage in the book I like too, which is um, as radically different as those ground floors are, you know, my partner and I care about the same things. You know, we care about the question of what are we doing here? Why did we come to be here? Um, how are we supposed to treat one one another? What does it mean to be a good person? What does it mean to be a meaningful life? And so, 
to some extent, you know, whether or not you're you're turning to God to answer those questions is a little bit less important than, than how much do you care about them and how much do you believe that finding meaningful answers to them is central to, to a meaningful life. And we both feel that way. So um, that's my long winded answer to the question about difference. Um, uh, and, and maybe that does, maybe that goes far enough to answer the question about, um, about navigating these issues with or without faith. Um, you know, grief is a tough one. Um, when you lose someone, I imagine that, that there's an enormous comfort to be feeling that, um, that there is a benevolent God and, and that, uh, that person in some way or another, um, is still available unto you or, or their, or their death has been right and necessary and, and, and part of a divine plan. Um, that said, a lot of very devout Christians, uh, have certainly wrestled with the problem of suffering and with the problem of death and grief. I mean, this book, um, was written, my book was written very much with, uh, another book in mind, C.S. Lewis's Grief Observed, which was about the death of his wife. And Lewis was about as devout a Christian as you could be, and, and also about as sophisticated of a Christian thinker as you could be. Um, and it didn't stop him from being horribly dismayed, um, distraught, uh, undone really, uh, by, by the loss of his wife. So I don't know that, um, I don't know that any kind of faith can really protect us fully in the face of these hard life moments or that, or that it should, you know, we are here to love one another. And, um, that comes at a, at a kind of cost in, in terms of, uh, grief and sorrow when we lose them. Yeah, and I think for me that tied so beautifully together, especially in the and section with this idea of, you know, we're, we're here to watch, right? And I think that's something that C and your dad did so beautifully. I mean, and there's that passage where I think one of the first times you and C are kind of walking through the Hudson Valley and it's like, she's noticing everything. And you say, you know, she can be driving in a car, not miss a beat and be like, oh, there's a turtle in a row, in, in the road. And she's not taking her eyes, you know, while she's driving. And I think that to me was so poignant, you know, this idea that we're, we're not here to hold on to everything and to, to keep, because in some sense, no matter what you believe there, there is a letting go that we have in our lives. Like you also do this great job of saying, you know, life goes on, which sounds like a, a fright saying, but it's like, it does from grief and from happiness and from all of these things. Um, and I think sometimes that can make us feel like, what's the point, but then it's like, well, the point is, you know, that that we're here in the moment to watch it, to observe it, to notice it and share it. Um, so that was something to me that really stuck out and, and showed like that big similarity between you and C because she seems like from, from the book, just such a wonderful watcher and noticer and observer of, of life. Mm. Yeah. Again, you're, you're such a great reader. Um, it's a beautiful connection between, um, this, this point I'm making, which in some ways is the fundamental point of the book of, um, of bearing witness, right? That's, that's all we can really do is, is to watch over one another and, and act as each other and, and of what we regard as important in life. Um, and then, uh, the, the fact that I fell in love with this person who, um, is yes, one of the, one of the best watchers I've ever met, um, you know, truly just about the world around her, both in the literal sense. I mean, it is true that like, I've never met anyone who can like walk across a field of grass talking to, but like literally pick like four, four leaf clovers along. I found one four leaf clover in my entire life, <laughs> uh, but, but, but she just notices things. It's interesting. It, it almost, um, it's like when you meet someone and they're just like, you know, they have perfect pitch or they're, um, you know, astonishing mathematicians. And you're like, huh, it must be really interesting to live inside your brain. Like, I don't have that brain. <laughs> No, I'm actually not very observant. I mean, a, you know, a, a tank could drive past me and someone would say, look at the tank. And I'd say, what tank? You know, um, So it's it's delightful to um, to be with someone who observes the world in that way. Um, but of course, it's not just literal, right? It's um, it's the ability to see other people uh, and, and see the essence of things and, and pay attention. Um, and, you know, I think that real attention comes with a kind of moral responsibility you know i think when we really see things we feel moved by them and we feel obligated toward them um it's why we care about things like you know are our cities and our communities wildly segregated are are our homeless 
populations, um, you know, driven out of parks and, and are, our, you know, seating and bus stations constructed to make it impossible to lie down. We care because that makes problems invisible. You know, I mean, you can't see a problem. Um, you don't, you don't know about it and, and, and you can't respond to it and, and decide what should be done about it. And that's why news is important too, right? We need, we need, um, we need to call attention to things that are happening in the world because until we, uh, until we literally can make them visible, we don't really do much about them. So I do think of attention as, um, as moral, you know, as, as the beginning of um, feeling that we care about the world. You know, we have to, we really do have to see it first in the same way that we have to see one another. You know, I, I think we're, we're kindest to one another when we really see someone's pain or someone's struggle, or you don't understand why your colleague has been so difficult. And then you learn maybe one fact about their life and you think, oh my gosh, like I'm a horrible monster. I had no idea what they were dealing with. Like it's important. Seeing is, is really important. Um, so yes, that's, thank you for identifying what I think of as kind of the, the deep and ultimate point of the book, which is we can't hold on to things forever. Um, wonderful, incredible things fall into our lap and wonderful, incredible things are taken from us. And, and we can't control all of that, but we certainly can, um, we can be reminded of how precious they are and, and reminded to tend to them while we can. Yeah, and just thinking about all that, it's kind of remarkable to me that that all is in the book. And then there's this like delicious love story. Like I was cheesing so hard when I was reading about UNC fell, falling in love. Like I felt like it was a friend texting me whether like, you know, I just met someone, <laughs> I'm going on the first date, like we just kissed or whatever. It was. I mean, and on all kind of the different aspects you bring in of these different theories we have about love, you know, is it that like we should be out there searching for someone or we should be focusing on ourselves and when our and when, you know, this magical, like our life is complete, this person's going to walk in. But how did you, I mean, yeah, you just do such an evocative job of writing about this, this process of falling in love, but how, how did you kind of decide you were going to string that together and yeah, just looking back on it as you like, what was that research like? Or did you had you already read all of those books about falling in love? Because that to me was such a just like joyful, like even just as I'm thinking about it, like I couldn't read those passages and not like smile. Like I just felt like such a dork, but I was like, it was so wonderful. I'm so happy to hear you say that because I think it's um it's easy with a book like this for it to get slotted in as like, oh, a book about grief. And I'm like, it's a passionate love story too. You know, in fact, in general, I think it's a book about love of, of various kinds, but um, I'm glad you felt like I was just like texting you after every date um, <laughs> because certainly I was, I was overjoyed after um, kind of all of these unfolding interactions uh, with my partner that I describe. And it was such a pleasure to get to share them with the world. Um, it's an interesting question you ask about reading. I, um, when I sat down to write this book, I, I knew it was partly about grief and partly about love. So I went and I read about grief and there's 450 million books about grief, many of them very good. Um, and then I turned my attention to love and um, went looking for a happy love story. And I will tell you that if you are in the market for a happy love story that, that really dwells in the particularities of love uh, and, and stays with the happiness and doesn't end in divorce or death or some other form of calamity, um, you have a very short reading list in front of you. Uh, it, it's amazingly hard to find happy love stories, uh, which is part of why it was so much fun to write one. Um, so I did read a lot about love and, um, and wound up, you know, reading as, as you saw, partly, um, about people thinking about love instead of just telling love stories, because so many love stories either end the minute to people meet and are happy and, and you don't really get any feel for what it's like to like be in love and be in an ongoing happy relationship. Um, or they, um, or, or as I said, they're, they're, they end in tragedy. Um, so I wound up reading a lot of how people have thought about love. You know, what do we, what do we make of this emotion? You know, why, why does it exist? Um, how, how is this mysterious thing called love at first sight possible if indeed it is possible? Uh, because I did know very, very early on, uh, that I was in love with my partner. Um, curiously, uh, my parents knew that about each other and her parents knew that about each other also. So there's kind of a, um, there's a family history on both sides of, of uh, falling in love very quickly. And I was interested in that. And, and um, so 
my rule of thumb as a writer is there's nothing I'm thinking about that smarter people um, haven't already thought about. <laughs> so, you know, there's, um, th there's always cause to go back and, and read the classics uh, or, or read voices you admire because um, heaven knows with something like love, who hasn't thought about it, right? You know, you can go read Shakespeare, you can go read Plato, uh, you can go read whoever you want to read, um, Bell Hooks, Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, uh, you know, Elizabeth Bishop, um, and and you get this assemblage of really wise voices who who together are far more insightful than I ever could be about love. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess my basic feeling is why why wouldn't you um, borrow these brilliant voices when you can if if they're saying uh, deep things about uh, about the subject you're thinking about. <laughs> in that sense, I slightly think of writing as a little bit of an anthology. You know, it's always nice to feel like you're introducing readers to, uh, or reintroducing them to, to voices other than your own. Yeah, and I think for me, I mean, there's that passage where you say, I feel like it says everything in this one line where you say, you're, you're not gonna describe the, that, that first night between you and C, except to say that you could, you know, in such specificity. Um, and, the other thing that I'm thinking about, sorry, is my Wi-Fi in the fritz a little? I'll pause for a second. Okay, hopefully I'm coming back. Um, so the other thing, um, Catherine, that I was gonna say about that, that I thought was really interesting in terms of the love story, and I'll drop it into the chat in case my, my Wi-Fi is breaking up, um, but you talk about this idea of extending the middle. Um, I don't know, Catherine, maybe not if you can hear me. I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you, Kiki. So I'm hoping okay. um, if if everything is clear and working well on my end, um, if someone can uh, add the question to the chat, I can field it that way. Yeah, I'll drop into the chat right now. Ah, can I talk a little bit about extending the middle? Um, Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I hope you guys will tell me if anyone's having trouble hearing or seeing me. Um, yes, you know, I think with so many love stories, um, the, 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 they either end, as I was saying, kind of right when things get going, you know, with the, um, with a couple meeting and falling in love and maybe getting married. Uh, and, and, you know, we have this flip phrase after, which is literally how stories happily ever after um which is to say all the happiness happens after the book is over you know we never get to dwell in it and we never get to think about it uh we never get to kind of take apart like well, what is happiness you know and, and what's the texture of, of daily life when when you're in love and you're in a happy relationship what does that mean um or alternatively um as i said they, they end in disaster so there's there's no dwelling in the happiness um and what was so striking to me about that so those are literary conventions, right? And I get why, you know, um, it's, there's a lot of drama and suspense and excitement about like, will two people get together? Uh, and, and once that's resolved, it can feel like, well, you know, we've, we've done our work here. Um, and obviously there's, there's drama and excitement uh, and tear jerkers and, and all manner of things if, if things just don't work out. Um, but those literary conventions to me do not map very well onto what it's like to actually be in love. Um, which is basically the opposite thing, right? Like all you want is to dwell in the kind of happy middle of a relationship. You know, you don't, um, you don't, of course, want it to end. You know, someday it will, if only because eventually one, eventually both of you will die in one, some order or another. Um, but, but unlike in literature, we want to stick with the happiness, right? Uh, we want to stick with the part that, that, um, you know, people are forever trying to tell us are boring. Maybe they're just telling us that tacitly by not writing about them or, or making movies or art about them. But but I don't think the middle is boring at all. Um, and I deliberately spent some time in the book uh, kind of making the argument for the interestingness of happiness. And, um, and it's why I write about things like the function of difference in relationship. Um, and for that matter about arguments in relationship, you know, because um, I don't ever mean to suggest that that happiness is is static or or um, that we don't have to work to obtain it or that couples don't grow sometimes through friction. Uh, but to me, all of that's completely fascinating. Um, so yes, I, I was very um, invested in in this love story being a happy love story that dwelled inside and built the happiness instead of just ending there. 
Yeah, and I mean that fight that you guys have over the black bear when you're hiking is is so epic. And I thought I love that you you talked about those fights that you had in the first year of your relationship, and you say you know you fought terribly, not that you fought a lot or that your fights were were like major fights, but just that you were bad at fighting together. And I thought that was such a great way of of showing the arc of the first year of a relationship, um, and just showing that. This, this other idea that I think you play with this idea of totality that like life is lived in the in these contraries and falling in love or or grief it, it's just the way we feel so it's not one specific emotion or one one way of being but all of these things kind of coexist together um and I think that comes around to the idea that you talk about with C's dad that really stuck with me um which is this idea that our life is remarkable simply because life is remarkable. So I'll, I'll read this passage from um, 227. Um, uh, or sorry, 222 for anyone who's following along at home. Um, so in this passage, Catherine is talking about how C's dad says, um, I have often thought C's father Bill once told me that for a completely average person, I have lived a remarkable life. And then this is towards the bottom of the page. Um, I knew what he meant, and I knew that he that he would have felt the same even if he had never met us so much so much as a mayor. Because I too feel that way, that my days are exceptional, even when they are ordinary, that existence does not need to show us any more of any more of its famous or spectacular wonders to fill us with amazement. We live remarkable lives because life itself is remarkable, a fact that is impossible not not to notice if only suffering leaves us alone for long enough. Um, and I think we've lost Casper due to Wi-Fi, but I think that's a wonderful place to leave on is just how this book fills you with such a sense of awe and gratitude and this emotion that Kathleen talks about at the end, but just this almost an anticipatory grief, but that feels makes you feel so alive and is so life affirming. Um, so Catherine, thank you so much for reading this book. Um, okay, wait, I think Catherine is maybe back. Um, Catherine, <laughs> to get you up, I was just saying, I was just reading the passage on page 222 where um, Bill C's dad talks about um, living a remarkable life and your kind of answer to that and just saying how I thought that was a really great, great place to end the chat because I think what this book does such a wonderful job of is just showing how what's ordinary about our lives is also remarkable and that these things live besides each other, the, the commonplace in the mundane and the extraordinary. Um, so thank you for bringing that all out in this book. And it was so wonderful chatting with you. Um, we can't wait to see what you write next, no pressure, but we will be following you. Um, and yeah, just thank you for everything. Thank you so much, and I'm very sorry for the technological difficulties possibly brought on by rain on my end. I don't quite know, but uh, but thank you for bearing with them, and thank you so much for, for reading the book and reading it so thoughtfully and with so much love. Oh my gosh, of course, all good. And if everyone watching at home, you can stay on, and I'm going to announce our next pick. But Catherine, thank you so much again. Thank you so um, much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, so I just... Drop my book. Our next pick is Other People's Clothes by Calla Hinkle. So this book just came out earlier this month and it is so delicious. I read it um, over winter break. I had an early copy. It's a debut novel. It's set in the late aughts in Berlin and it is about two American art students who go abroad to study in Berlin and they end up renting this fabulous apartment from a, a, a known thriller writer. And soon after they move in, they suspect that this thriller writer who they're subletting from is watching them. And one of the art students who is obsessed with pop culture decides they're gonna they're gonna mess with this this woman and who's who's watching them and they're gonna give her some plot inspiration for her next thriller novel. So these two art students start hosting these elaborate over the top club nights at the apartment um, every Saturday night, and it becomes the the guest list becomes a whole thing everyone wants an invite to this party and then there's this big surprise twist in the novel where things go a little topsy-turvy so 
it is so fun, such a great, it's just a rush of a novel. I had such a good time reading it and I can't wait for everyone to pick up a copy and join us. We are gonna update our Goop, Goop Book Club landing page at the beginning of March. So it's goop.com slash Goop Book Club. Um, so you can go there at the beginning of March and you'll see a Q and A with Kala, an excerpt from the book so you can start reading. Um, and at any point you can join our Facebook group to discuss. And then I'm just gonna check my date. So, okay, so I'll be back on here on Thursday, March 31st at 9 a.m. Pacific time, um, speaking with Kala. So you can tune in then. And yeah, thank you so much for following along and please get a copy of Other People's Clothes. It is such a fun read. It feels like going to the best party, except minus the hangover, you wake up actually feeling a little bit smarter. So highly recommend it. And thank you all for joining today and we'll see you next time.